Welcome to Your Life Simplified. My name is Brian Leitner, and I'll be the host of this podcast. In today's discussion, we're going to talk a little bit about estate planning, what that means, what's involved, who's involved, and why it is critical for everyone to have an estate plan. And today, I am joined by George Fernandez, the Vice President of Practice Management for Mariner Wealth Advisors. George, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, it's good to be here, Brian. George, just as way of introduction, maybe take 60 seconds or so, a little bit about your background and what you do. Sure. Uh, well, as Vice President for Practice Management here at Mariner Wealth Advisors, one of the things that I do is help our advisors you know, work with their clients, building resources and delivering those training resources to, to our advisors. But over the years, you know, I've spent... Uh, 15 years in banking in total. I worked uh, in a retail bank environment, uh, but also worked as a financial advisor myself, having clients sat, sitting across the desk from a client, helping them make decisions like the ones we're talking about today. And, and over that time, I've, I've kind of learned how to work with clients and, and have those conversations. And I like helping advisors learn how to do this too. And that's kind of what got me into the track of, of working with advisors and practice management. That's great. So in your conversations with advisors, where does estate planning as a topic sort of fall on the list in terms of conversations they're having with clients or or how important that conversation truly is? Regardless of whether you realize it or not, everybody has an estate plan. You know, if you don't make one up yourself, your state's going to create one for you. So it's really the top of the list, you know, next to, you know, how you're managing your money, how you're managing your cash flow, for example. But it's really up there at the top because if something happens to you, your money is going to go somewhere. Your assets are going to go somewhere. Those things you own are going to go to someone. The question is, who do you want that to go to? George, that's a great point, because if you take the default option, the federal government has their estate plan, and then the state in which you reside has their own state estate plan for you. So the yeah. do-nothing option, there's still an option. Uh, so you're actively not taking any action, and that's problematic if you don't have something in place. So, George, before the show, I uh, was doing a little research, and CNBC has this CNBC Millionaire Survey. And just a couple of years ago, they found that less than 40% of those with investable assets of over a million dollars um, have not created even a basic estate plan. So this is troubling, obviously, for a lot of reasons, but maybe let's start at the top. You know, How do you define estate planning to someone? I like to define estate planning as, in this simple phrase. It's the right assets to the right people at the right time in the right way. So, George, that's a great explanation. That's a great way of breaking this down. I mean, sometimes within the wealth management business and we're so focused on you know getting things right uh, that we can be too technical. And this whole podcast is an opportunity to break it down and truly simplify things. So you, know, you broke it down into almost four buckets, right? Assets, people, time, and way. And just to sort of comment on that, the assets are really everything we own, right? Everything that's in your house uh, could be a baseball car collection, could be you know your bank accounts, your brokerage accounts, your cars, all those types of things. Uh, the people are pe potentially people in your life that may um, ultimately receive some of these assets, either by gift or by some sort of inheritance. Um, it could be, um, you know, it could be your, your alma mater. It could be your um, your church or temple or religious institution or so forth. But other people might be, of course, the people that are around the table helping you craft what's most important to you and putting a plan together, yeah, right? Exactly. And then maybe even helping you um, or helping your your descendants and family when you're no longer around with the distribution of those assets. Uh, you mentioned time. Again, we talk about passing of wealth and so forth, whether that's done while you're alive, whether that's done after your death, uh, depending upon what your goals are, and then the right way in which assets are passed down. And what I think people get confused a lot is that they have in their mind where assets are going to go. And they simply believe that this is the plan that they put in place, but they haven't documented anything. And what happens there is those just become sort of a wish unless they are documented and respected by the government. And so when we talk about ways of passing assets, uh, they could pass in a variety of different ways. It is just a wish. And so you do want to make sure that you document it and that you have, you know, for example, you want to look at, you know, how your assets are titled. You want to look at the instructions that you have, you know, uh, and your, your beneficiary designations on your IRAs. Or your, or your assets, or you want to look at, have you declared what that looks like in a will, uh, which would be a document that would es essentially explain what you want to have happen uh, and when. So, so let's talk about that for a minute, because I think that a lot of people simply say, I have a will, my will says, this is the way my assets get distributed. But 
the reality is the will doesn't distribute all your assets, right? The will is just distributing what's going to ultimately go through probate. And we can get into that term in just a minute. So how else are assets then passed and what does that look like? Yeah. So you can have assets. You first look at the way your assets are titled. So for example, if you own a home uh, with you and your spouse, uh, then it's you, you know, your name and your spouse's name. And if something happens to you, depending upon the state you live in, uh, it will go directly to your spouse, um, you know, with without any division of assets. If it's, uh, and that term is joint with the joint, rights yeah, of joint, survivorship. Joints right? with, joint tenants with the rights of survivorship. Okay. That would be like a checking account too, or a savings account, or an investment account. It might be a joint tenants with the rights of survivorship. So that automatically would go to your spouse at that point. So it completely bypasses your will. And the same could be said for things like an IRA or a retirement account where you designate a beneficiary. A beneficiary designation is going to take precedence over your will as well. Uh, so it, you know, those things, as you pointed out, you know, your will is a list of instructions for anything that doesn't have somebody already designated to receive it through titling or through beneficiary designation. So that's a really important part. It's uh, things will pass. Some will pass by will and others will pass by contract of law. And so by contract of law, if you have a 401k, a 403b, a retirement account, now, if you've seen those documents before, you elect that primary beneficiary, hopefully a contingent beneficiary. Those have nothing to do with the will. They, in fact, supersede the will. Same thing with a life insurance contract. Again, anything by contract is going to pass outside of that will, right? Exactly. So again, some assets will pass outside the will, and then those that pass through the will will go through the probate process. And to, to make it just really easy, the, the probate process is effectively proving the will and making sure that uh, the assets are being distributed in a way in which the will states they are. And probate's not necessarily all a bad thing, uh, but to the extent that you can avoid it, it'll avoid assets being tied up for a period of time in the probate system. There are fees involved. So in generally speaking, there's no reason to go through probate with the right proper planning. I think a lot of people do have a misconception that probate is always a bad thing. And, you know, uh, and yeah, I think it can add some some complexity to an estate planning situation or, or estate distribution. The other part, too, is it's also public. You know, that's really important, too. But there is a requirement, you know, that an executor will have to look at you know, not only what you own and take take an accounting for everything that you own, but they also have to look at what you owe. And the probate court is does require uh, that you publicize, you know, that, that you've got to probate going on and that if you owe any or if you're owed any money by this particular uh, decedent, then you need to make sure that you make stake your claim, so to speak. Um, and so there's an obligation that the, that the uh, estate should take care of any, any outstanding bills. And sometimes that's where the probate really does help out. So George, let's go through some of the basic documents that I think everyone needs, regardless of their uh, financial situation. So this could apply to someone who has you know, several thousand dollars, this could apply to somebody who has uh, millions and millions of dollars. And the reality is, I mean, these are the fundamentals of estate planning documents. So it's not to say that these will cover everything, but as a place to start, you have a will, you have a living will, you have health care powers of attorney, uh, you may have powers of attorney for, for, for your financial situation, um, as well as HIPAA documents and so forth. And so let's let's talk a little bit about each of those. So we talked about the will and how it may not distribute all assets, but the reality is they are still important. What are some of the reasons that they are still important? Yeah, a will is, is important because it's kind of your final set of instructions. Anything that can, kind of, you know, kind of catches everything uh, as far as, uh, you know, when all, you know, any, any assets perhaps didn't get thrown into a beneficiary designation or don't have a, a you know, a contingent owner, uh, for example, you might you're going to need to have a will to identify what to do with that particular asset. You know, for example, we had a situation. I was working with a client, and uh, they had this property that was that it was family owned property. They completely forgot about that mm -hmm. they inherited, and um, and the will was something that they needed to have. You know, to basically handle the distribution of that particular asset because it wasn't covered in, their, in a trust, which we'll talk about. It wasn't covered in business beneficiary designation. So the probate court had to determine the disposition of that asset, and if there was not a will. Then the court was going to then basically step in and say, well, here's what we're going to do then. Yeah, they're referring to that as a sort of pour over will, right? So right. things that aren't documented somewhere else just sort of pour over yeah. uh, in that sense. So that, that makes sense. Um, and obviously also for those that have young children, right? Incredibly important to make sure that's where guardians are actually named. And so I know we were joking about this just the other day and how people will talk about, uh, 
you know, the fact that I have godparents set up for my children and uh, maybe that term was more popular back in the day. Uh, and that, again, I go back to that was sort of a wish or a desire. But if that's not documented inside of a will, the state will step in with their own plan, regardless on whether you ask somebody to be godparents or not. It really doesn't matter if it wasn't documented in the right legal fashion. Yeah, that's a really great point. And if you have a godparent who's non-family, for example, and you don't document it, then you know the court's going to decide that, sorry, it's not going to go to a non-family member. They're going to be looking at family first. And, uh, and unfortunately, in many cases, if you don't have family that's willing or able, uh, they're not going to go to the godparent. They're going to then go through foster care and determine where they're going to go from there. George, talk to me about a living will. Yeah, living will, uh, you think of an advanced directive, you know, the, the instructions that if you are no longer able to make medical decisions on your own, who do you want to have make those decisions? And that's where the health power will come in in just a few minutes. But in a, but this is really where you're outlining, you know, do you want to do not resuscitate? Uh, do you want to have, you know, your uh, physician to determine whether or not you should receive care or, or, and so forth? But you really need to have that laid out of what your expectations are. If you can't make decisions you know, from a health perspective on your own, how do you want your life to be prolonged uh, if, you know, if at all? Um, it's very important that people understand what your wishes are. You just can't have a conversation and expect them to to necessarily follow that if there's no direction for you, uh, because it's a highly emotional period uh, when you find yourself in that situation. You want to make sure that your wishes are definitely outlined. You know, I think that's an excellent point when you said, you know, you're in that time, right? Maybe you're not of, maybe you're of a sound mind because you have to be of sound mind legally for the documents to make sense. But I think we all know, um, you know, you're, you're, you're potentially under some sort of duress. And so, I mean, this is true of all types of planning, but but truly critical when you're talking about documents that are going to either keep you alive or or not. And so, you know, putting a plan in place when you're in the right state of mind, doing this early, right? It's it's almost that uh, you know, a dentist would call preventative care, right? Doing things when it's appropriate will save you a great deal of heartache and potentially mistake down the line. And so, inside of this living will, you're effectively stating um, the fact that you may not want A, B, and C should something happen to you. And then you alluded to the fact that um, you may name somebody. And that's where the healthcare proxy comes in? Yeah, the healthcare power of attorney will then come in because that's the documentation you're going to be using with your hospital, your doctor's office. Say, yes, you have the power to be able to exercise what is in my living will. Now, there'll also be HIPAA documents that will generally come into play as well, which is sharing of information. Uh, so a little bit different. Uh, HIPAA documents, and it depends on, on the state, but generally, they're not looking at that as making decisions as much as sharing information. The healthcare power is really what gives you the, you know, the power to actually make the decisions, generally speaking. You know, the HIPAA documents are, are really interesting. And I know that they've a lot of people now know about them, right? They've been around since, I believe, the 90s. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this really came to be where you'd have, you know, the, maybe the husband gets involved in some sort of accident and, uh, you know, their, their spouse or significant other uh, comes in and asks the doctor what's wrong. And the problem is, I mean, via HIPAA and privacy, that information cannot be shared with that other individual unless they have a HIPAA on file. It's uh, based on the litigious society we live in and so forth. Um, so those documents are really important for everyone to have. And I would specifically tell you that I think something that gets overlooked on a regular basis is that child of yours who say over the age of 18, and maybe they go off to school and something you know, potentially happens to them, they wind up in the hospital and the parents run up there and they ask the doctor and staff, what's wrong with my son? What's wrong with my daughter? And they say, if there's not a HIP on file, I'm sorry, I can't tell you what's wrong with them. So they're an adult. maybe as a, that's exactly it. So as a tip, if you have kids that are going off to school, make sure, again, you have that HIPAA document in place. It's just one of those critical documents. Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, when my, all, all three of my kids, when they turned 18, I said, happy birthday. Guess what you get to do? You get to go meet the attorney. Because we sat down, we went through, we created a basic will, we created a, you know, a, a, um, a power of attorney, and we created you know, all the healthcare power and directives. They must uh, have been so happy with their dad <laughs> on their 18th birthday, they Absolutely. got to be with an attorney. Absolutely. Absolutely. Who wouldn't? Who wouldn't? Exactly. Exactly. But you know, we had twice where we, had, we were glad that we had those. Um, our son was hospitalized, and uh, we had that paperwork in file you know, in hand when we went to the hospital. And, you know, uh, our daughter, you know, needing help at the college, you know, we were able to have access to information. Now, the college did have its own HIPAA pay forms, too, by the way. So that you might check with your college because they may have their own forms they want you to fill out. And the uh, 
the other document we're going to talk about in the same sense of, of documents was uh, you know powers of attorney, right? Especially as it relates to the financial side. And I know that uh, you know spouses will likely have that on each other. Um, there's different types of powers of attorney. You know, one could be a springing power of attorney, which means I don't really have any power over, say, my wife's accounts until it springs into action, right? Potentially due to a, a maybe she becomes disabled or something like that, some sort of event where it springs into action. Or there's a durable power of attorney, which means that I can act on my wife's behalf with her accounts today. She doesn't have to be disabled or anything that happened to her, and sure. vice versa. So. I think there's pros and cons of both, and people just need to think through what's best for them. But those are some of the powers of attorney people need to think about. I know it's very common for people to have powers of attorney over their uh, parents' accounts, especially if they're maybe, you know, uh, once as they get older and so forth and want to have someone help them, maybe their children help them with some of their finances. I think that's very common. Uh, yeah, very common. I think one of the really important piece that you want to you focus your attention on, too, and that is if you name someone as a power of attorney, uh, so for you mentioned you and your wife, for example, but if something happened to either one of you or both of you, then who comes, who steps in? So you need a kind of a contingent power of attorney. Well, or, and in that particular case, you want to make sure you have a conversation with that person before you do that. You want to, <laughs> guess you want, what? Yeah. I mean, may give you some, it may give you a little hint into whether you want to make it springing or not. Right. <laughs> uh, but you do want to make sure that they're comfortable with the idea of having to do that. Um, it's a great point. I mean, we, we always think about who the primary beneficiary is on something or who is the, the person that we're going to name who's going to, to do A, B, and C. But the reality is um, that person may not be around, right? That contingent beneficiary, I'm sorry, that primary beneficiary. So it's important to always have some sort of successor, whether it be on the beneficiary side yeah. um, or on you know, some of these documents and so forth. So one thing that we didn't discuss in some of those basic documents uh, was the idea of a trust, right? And there's so many different types of trusts out there. There are you know, revocable living trusts. There are irrevocable trusts. Let's talk a little bit about revocable trusts uh, at a high level as well as trust, to, just to give people an understanding on how they're different. Right. And I think the important thing to remember about trust is that it's, it's similar to, you know, when you think of a will, it's, it, it's a list of instructions, it's directions as to what you want to have happen and when, but it's actually... Um, also allows you to title things in the names of a trust. You don't title things in the name of a will, right? So a trust actually becomes the entity that owns those particular assets that you have titled under it. And the nice thing about that is that they continue on even when you're not able or you're not around. Revocable living trusts, I think, are, are great tools that allow you to specify the, the kind of what we said at the very beginning. It's the right assets to the right people at the right time in the right way. A trust is specifically designed to do exactly that. You identify what assets by titling them in the name of the trust. You identify in the trust who the people are that are going to receive it. You identify in the trust at what point in time they're going to receive it. So you can be very, very specific as to what the rules are related to when they're going to get it and, and the way they're going to receive it. So whether it's an outright distribution or whether it's going to be an income distribution, for example. So you can create a trust to be very, very specific in how you want those assets distributed over your lifetime or even beyond your lifetime, which is really a powerful thing. The other part of that, too, is, is that it's not public knowledge. I mean, you were not po posting like we would a will through probate that says, hey, this person's now deceased. Let everybody, you know, letting, letting everybody know that if you have a claim, then you need to let us know kind of thing. This is all private. And so it just continues on. It's as if you are still living in that sense. And being revocable, you can change your mind. And so you and your wife might be the trustees of that particular trust. And over time, if things change, life events happen, you can go back and you can amend that trust later. Yeah, I think for, so for all intents and purposes, outside of you know, what happens at death and all those good things, if you create a living trust and you take the assets that you have, so my name is Brian Leitner, so I would take my brokerage account, for example, or... Uh, other assets of mine, they would now be owned by the trust. Yes. So I'm, effectively, it's just a retitling issue. I still have full control over that. I have not given that right away to anybody. But what I'm what I'm ultimately doing is I'm setting myself up for success because if something should happen to me, we mentioned disability earlier, inside of that living trust, I'm naming somebody else to come in and be able to take over uh, my assets and so forth. And follow the rules I set forth inside of that trust document. And in my situation, exactly. I am married. 
My wife, Melissa, would then take over those assets. They would be, still be in the name of the trust, and she would have full access to those to manage them in the way in which we deemed fit prior to my becoming disabled in that example. Perfect example. Perfect example. Yeah, my wife and I did the same thing. You know, and In fact, we, we had a special circumstances where we had a, a house that we owned and my mother-in-law lived with us. And so we had to have a special trust that allowed us to allow the house to continue to be for her if something happened to us. But then when she passed away, then we had to update that trust. So that was no, because that was no longer an issue. So that revocable trust allowed us that flexibility of managing if we weren't there, managing for somebody else, and then we were able to change it easily afterward. Yeah, George, that's an excellent example of the flexibility that trust can provide. And, and that everyone's situation is a bit different, right? Yeah. And so I know that there are, um, you know, different advertisements that you hear on the radio and, you know, we'll do a trust for you. We'll do a will for you. You know, act now. It's, uh, you know, with this exclusive TV offer or something like that. And um, because everyone's situation is different, you really need to take the time and work with the appropriate wealth advisory team to make sure that, you know, your wishes are carried out based upon your unique circumstances. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so we talked about these revocable living trusts. And ultimately, when when couples die or when individuals die, um, those trusts can become testamentary trusts, right? So now they become effectively irrevocable after that death, depending upon what's named inside of the entire estate plan. Um, or you can set up a trust from the get-go. It can be irrevocable, starting with an I, which is different than revocable. An irrevocable trust from the just from the start is generally going to be you want to identify a particular group of assets that need to be separated from your estate today and that you're not going to change your mind, essentially. And there are a variety of different ways that you or reasons why you might do that. Um, but effectively, what you're doing is you're saying, I'm taking these assets, I'm earmarking them for this particular purpose, and I'm not going to be able to change my mind. And it's set in stone at that point in time. And that becomes an irrevocable trust at that point. An example of an irrevocable trust might be an irrevocable life insurance trust where effectively the trust is buying a policy on someone. And ultimately, when that someone passes, that insurance policy will be paid out to a trust for the benefit of whoever is named or those that are named inside of that irrevocable life insurance trust. Exactly. So we've talked about some of these legal documents. And you know, I think we alluded to some of the folks that are named in these documents. So I think it might help if we just go through who are the people that we're actually naming in these documents and some of the terms that are referred to in our business? Right? Yeah. Yeah. So we talked about the will itself. We talked about an executor. So who's the executor? Yeah. The executor, executrix, um, you know, depend, it's, it's your personal representative that you have named to handle your affairs essentially at your death. And this individual will be responsible for, you know, collecting all the information that you have. Uh, that you own, anything that you owe, putting it all together, notifying the appropriate authorities, whether it be the government or whether it be Social Security, for example, or uh, the lenders that you have or bank accounts, whatever, uh, could be family members in addition to that. It's also working with the probate court because they're going to have to take this will and they're going to need to take it and admit it, to, you know, submit it to the probate court for it to be reviewed and determined to be valid. And which will allow you to then take the instructions within that document and exercise those instructions. And George, after you go through that list of all of the responsibilities, you know, I think what people need to really understand is when you name an executor, uh, I think a lot of times people sort of name that person off the cuff, if you will, and they're not truly thinking through, is this person going to be able to handle all this? Are they responsible enough? Yeah. And what, what that looks like, right? So it's just, it's a really important um, piece of the puzzle. And I think that individual really needs to understand what they're taking on. No different than a guardian to some degree, right? Right, right. I think we were saying earlier that, you know, with the power of attorney, we want to have a conversation before you name the power of attorney. It's the same with an executor. And then we talked about trustees, right? And, and that's a little bit, that's that's similar in that extent. I mean, you have a lot of responsibilities. So as a trustee, what what are some of those responsibilities? Yeah, very similar. In, in fact, uh, I would say that the trustees' responsibilities are even greater, you know, and can last a lifetime depending upon the trust itself. So you have an executor, for example, and that's just going to be, you're going to get through the probate process. And once it's done, it's done. There's not much you're going to do, if anything, ever after that. A trustee, however, you pretty much have said, guess what? You get to be the trustee for, for my kids or my family or whomever 
for perhaps the rest of your life, depending upon how much is in this, this particular trust. Some of those examples are going to be the things we just talked about. It's going to be the organization of assets. It's going to be uh, distribution, distribution of those assets. It's following whatever the dictates of that trust are is what they're going to be responsible for, which means they need to understand how the trust works. So they got to be able to read the trust and understand that. That's really important. That's, that's kind of a critical piece there. Uh, they need to have, know how it fits within the state they live in. So they need to know the rules of their particular state. Um, and by the way, they're going to be dealing with all the beneficiaries, too, who are going to come knocking on the door. Yeah, there's it, to your point, it's a lot of responsibility in addition to some of the stuff you talked about, but the taxes themselves. Oh, yeah. And making sure, I mean, they are ultimately going to be accountable for this. And a lot of folks, uh, you know, they have their own day jobs. They have their own families. And where we see a great deal of issues is the family conflict. So I think when you're thinking about, hey, who should that trustee be? You want to think about who's competent. You want to think about the you know, inter interworkings of that family relationship and dynamics. You also want to think about, hey, does it make sense to have an impartial party? Corporate trustee, they do these all the time. They do thousands of these things. And they know exactly how to handle those delicate situations when you're working with conflict within family as well. Another great person to have in your corner is a wealth advisor who will know your whole situation and can coordinate and quarterback all of the professionals that you need to have and also work with the you know, whomever you happen to name as a trustee and executor as well. There are really a couple of others that are, might be really, really important to touch on. One is, is a personal property memorandum. And which is an attachment that you generally have to your legal documents that identifies pretty much everything that you own. And, and I think that's a really important thing because if you have certain heirlooms, certain things that you want to go to specific family members and you want to be very clear who they're going to go to, you need to be you need to create this personal property memorandum in order to attach that to your will. And you need to update it because you might give stuff away before you die, which I would encourage. If you want to go to somebody, give it to them now. Enjoy it now. Um, so I think that's really important. And George, as it relates to the personal property memorandum, we talked about a lot of what estate planning is, is timing and conversations and so forth. And so I think it's a really good idea to have those conversations about where you want those assets to go while you're still alive to reduce some of that family conflict that may take place later. And I know this may sound funny, um, maybe even silly to some, uh, but I will tell you, I've worked with clients that will literally have a note under certain assets around the house, whether it's, you know, grandma's dining sticky room notes. table. It's exactly yeah. sticky notes. Post-it notes, right? <laughs> that's, that's, they'll have yeah. those. They'll keep them updated. Yeah. Um, but we use colored is, dots. Is that right? Yeah. We use, <laughs> yeah, we use colored dots. <laughs> but they're, those types of, that's just another way to communicate, right? In advance of whether you're doing that or not. Again, whether you think that's uh, the right thing to do or not, it's all about having that conversation well in advance of something happening. And as we think about timing, no one knows when we're going to uh, ultimately pass. So having the conversations earlier than later just make a lot of sense. It really does. And I've been through this personally, and I've seen the ramifications of not having things you know, specified and the rift that it causes. Uh, but I've also seen the joy that it, that it creates. You know, when mom is able to give away, you know, certain things now, uh, you know, and then saying, OK, at my death, this goes to so and so. And I've seen that power, too. From what I've seen, more times than not, most people don't fight over the cash, but they do fight over those heirlooms, absolutely. those that have sentimental value. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The other one is is a letter of instruction. And, and the reason I bring this one up is because this was really powerful for myself and my family. You know, when my mom passed away of an aneurysm at age 62, I talked to her on a Wednesday and she was gone by Saturday. Wow. And, um, and it was what we didn't know was that she had created a little booklet, a little folder in her file cabinet. Said, if anything ever happens to me, go to the file cabinet and grab this green green folder. And when we looked in there, there was a letter of instruction. It had everything outlined: who to call. Incredible. It was, uh, you know, the, the final burial arrangements. What she wanted had, you know, what she wanted, you know, versus she wanted to have at her mass. Who she wanted to speak at mass. I mean, it was very, very specific as to who was going to do what and when. And so that was a gift because we didn't have to make all those decisions. It was already done. And that was a, just a simple letter of instruction that said, here's all the things that we that I want to make sure that you take care of. I've already done it for you. And when you're dealing at a time of grief, yeah. um, the last thing you want to do is start looking for where those assets are or trying to understand exactly. what their ultimate wishes were. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
It's yeah. Important. Yeah. It was, a, it was an incredible experience for us. We never considered her an organized person. So when this happened, it was like out of the blue. <laughs> <laughs> so it's quite amazing. Okay. You know, so as we think about the process of getting started for those that, that haven't done anything, it really depends on where you're starting. Obviously, we encourage that individuals work with a wealth advisory team who can surround them with uh, the experts uh, that are required to put a plan together to make sure it's done the right way. Um, you know, you're talking about potentially passing on uh, assets, whether they're significant or not. You're talking about making sure that young kids are taken care of with right the guardians and so forth. Doing it right the first time uh, makes a lot of sense in working with the right professionals. So where do people go from here when you think about the process? Um, you're talking about you know providing for your children, whether that means for, whether that's from a wealth perspective or inheritance or guardianships, whether it's making sure that your goals are ultimately accomplished, whether it is passing assets along in a tax efficient way. Um, there's a lot here and it's important to do it right the first time. So we recommend working with a wealth advisor team who can not only explain this process to you in more detail based upon your situation, but make sure it gets done right the first time and surround you with the expert that you need. From your perspective, as you're listening today and kind of thinking through this, is in, in my mind, is I think there's a couple things I would share. And that is, first, you want to be able to answer two questions. These two questions are going to sound a little strange, but the first one is this, and that is, you want to be able, and I'll put it in first person. What's important about money to me? Now, the reason I put it that way is because I want you to be able to look back and see, well, here's everything that I own. Here's the money that I have. Here's the assets that I have. What's important about those things to me? And the first thing you're probably going to think about are things like, well, it pays the bills. It covers all my expenses and gives me my lifestyle. But as you start, I challenge you to dig just a little bit deeper into that and find out why those things are important to you. And ultimately, what happens when you start digging a little bit deeper, why all those things are important to you, you discover there's a second question. And the second question is this, and that is, What's most important to me? And as you build an estate plan, you're really covering both of those things. It's the it's the you know the combination or the intersection, the convergence of those two questions that come together that create your your wealth plan. And when you're working with a wealth advisor, that's one of the things that happens is we automatically go through that conversation to discover what's important about money to you, as well as what's most important to you, and then making sure that those actions that you have are aligning with what your intentions are. I think that's really important. And working with a wealth advisor, that's where they help you bring those two things together to ensure that your actions and your intentions are aligned. Now, you might be thinking, okay, well, if I'm going to hire somebody, if I'm going to have somebody help me or create this team of people, how do I know who the right people are? Well, we've identified a few people, but the wealth advisor is really key in all this because they can help you quarterback that. Yeah, George, that's profound. Um, a lot of what you said there, um, I think, I think people dread the process sometimes of doing something, right? Especially estate planning. Um, I know that your kids at the age of 18 were super excited to meet with their attorney <laughs> and so forth. Yeah. Um, but, but for most, um, it's almost, I just want to get this over with. And the and they just want to sit down and get it done in a short period of time. This truly is a journey. I mean, this takes time not to execute documents, but it takes time to really think through what is important. What's not just on the surface, but what's that need maybe behind that need? What's really drives you to determine what is truly most important? So I thought that was a really interesting comment. The other I'd make is, you know, who are the right people to have on my team? Where's the, where are the right assets to go to, whether it be from a tax perspective or not. And so, you know, one of the things we always talk to clients about is really stress testing who's in your current documents now. And so I was in a meeting just a few weeks ago where we're looking at the trustee and I'm asking questions about the trustee and you know, the husband and wife look at me and say, that's Uncle Joe. I said, tell me about Uncle Joe. And Uncle Joe died two years ago. Right. And so those people are no longer around. Or I am going to name my daughter as the executor versus my son for these reasons. Well, let me ask you a couple of questions about your daughter, if they're if, if he or she is really qualified to do that. Or, you know, if you're going to be that individual that's acting as an agent regarding your health care power, are you going to be or is that person named stubborn enough to potentially have to fight and argue in order to accomplish your wishes Whereas maybe the hospital and doctor want to go in a different direction. So those are all things to think about as we stress test um, the people that are named in these documents. And, yeah. you know, one thing we should probably discuss is I have an estate plan. How often should it be reviewed? Yeah, uh, I would say three to five years, every three to five years. 
or when laws change, or if a life event happens. Yeah. You know that that's kind of happened to me with last year. My uh, my mother-in-law, you know, uh, passed away a year before, and so we, because of our estate plan, we needed our documents. We needed to change it because we considered her as part of our estate plan, and I guess in, in part of our estate plan, sure. I should say. Um, and so we needed to go back and revisit that because things had changed. And also, our kids were older too. Um, we told our kids, no longer do you have to go to Uncle Tom. Uh, <laughs> so. Well, so you know. I, Obviously, the estate plan is really important. Um, you know, I read something in the Wall Street Journal not too long ago. It said one of the number one issues um, for those of you that have created wills and estate plans is finding them. And so it's really important to make sure that they're kept in a safe place. I know, you know some people will think a safety deposit box or say a safety deposit box is the right place. Uh, maybe even a fireproof safe, you know, fireproof safes or fireproof that aren't smoke proof, who has the code and so forth. A lot of things of that nature. Um, you know, having something, I think, on file with a, with a wealth advisor, with an attorney, um, and obviously, you know, for clients at Mariner Wealth Advisors, we use our Mariner GPS system, so everything's digitally stored in the cloud, and we mm -hmm. make sure that the beneficiaries uh, and other loved ones have access to that information at all times. But again, something really important. So, George, we, we talked about a lot today. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank you for coming in. Um, I hope our listeners uh, really take action and... Uh, I hope our listeners have learned something about estate planning, how critical it is or how important it is, and uh, take action if, if appropriate. Yeah, I hope so, too. And, and, and um, if I can just paint a real quick picture of what this looks like. When my wife and I were in our 20s and her father passed away after battling cancer, when he died, there was a team of people that came to our assistance. It was the trust advisor. It was the, the broker or wealth advisor. Um, it was the attorney, the CPA, the banker, the insurance professional, and so forth. They came in, they stepped right in and said, here's everything you have to do. Here's how everything is laid out. You guys don't need to do anything, just, just mourn his loss. And that was huge. In fact, that was probably the seed that was planted in me that day that brought me to where I am today. I've been trying to recreate that with my clients for the last 30 years, helping them understand this is the way it can work for you. And when you have a team of people that come to your side in these kind of situation, it's powerful and it simplifies things more than you can ever imagine. That's great. It's uh, incredibly valuable at the right time, right? Yeah. So, George, thanks again for coming in. So I'm going to ask you the question that we ask all of our guests. So what is the worst financial decision you've ever made? Oh, wow, Brian, you're really making me vulnerable here and, and put me on the spot. I was, I was kind of a do-it-yourselfer. I had a planner for a long time, but I, she just kind of let me go with things too. And, um, and and when I came into this business, so to speak, I decided that I knew enough and I fired her. That was my biggest mistake. I still, have a, you still know this person very well. I do have a planner that I work with on a regular basis, uh, you know, now a friend of mine and, and we kind of collaborate, you know, since that's what I do today, right? Uh, but the biggest mistake I was is I, I, I realized that, you know, Planners need planners too, and it was something that I should not have done because it would it would have been uh, I made some mistakes, you know, in managing my own affairs, you know, when I came into the, came in and became a financial advisor, in fact, and doing things I probably shouldn't have done. That was probably the biggest mistake was firing my planner. It's interesting. It's a planners need planners, just like a psychiatrist need psychiatrists. Exactly. Right? Exactly. George, thanks <laughs> again for coming in. We have a series of articles regarding estate planning on our website at marinerwealthadvisors.com. If any of our listeners want to go peruse some of those documents and become more informed, that might be helpful. And again, if you guys have questions about what you've heard today or want to request a topic, please feel free to email us at podcast at marinerwealthadvisors.com. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast, please leave your comments on wherever it is that you listen to podcasts. That helps us a great deal. We know that your time is incredibly valuable, and we hope you find this podcast a worthwhile investment of your time. Thank you for listening. 
Mariner LLC, doing business as Mariner Wealth Advisors, or MWA, is an SEC-registered investment advisor. Registration of an investment advisor does not imply a certain level of skill or training. MWA is in compliance with the current notice filing requirements imposed upon registered investment advisors by those states in which MWA maintains clients. MWA may only transact business in those states in which a notice has been filed or qualifies for an exemption or exclusion from notice filing requirements. Any subsequent direct communication by MWA with a prospective client shall be conducted by a representative that is either registered or qualifies for an exemption or exclusion from registration in the state where the prospective client resides. For additional information about MWA, including fees and services, please contact MWA or refer to the Investment Advisor Public Disclosure website at www.advisorinfo.sec.gov. Please read the disclosure statement carefully before you invest or send money.